Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jakub Nowakowski. I'm the director of the Grisha Jewish Museum, and it is my uh, privilege uh, and, and a pleasure um, to welcome all of you at the today's uh, meeting, uh, Memories of Poland, Family Stories and Returns, meeting with Adam Shorin. Now I will speak in Polish uh, for a second, but yes, the entire meeting will take place in English. Um, szanowni Państwo, serdecznie witam. Nazywam się Jakub Nowakowski. Jestem dyrektorem Żydowskiego Muzeum Galicja w Krakowie i to mi przypada ta przyjemność, aby Państwa powitać na spotkaniu wspomnienia z Polski, rodzinne historie i powroty. Spotkanie z Adamem Szorinem. Jak Państwo zapewne wiecie, spotkanie będzie odbywać się w języku angielskim, natomiast będzie jest dostępne tłumaczenie. Tutaj w czacie macie Państwo informacje, jak przełączyć się na polskiego tłumacza. Jest to dosyć proste. Na dole ekranu znajduje się zestaw ikonek. Jedną z nich jest taki globus. Proszę na niego kliknąć i tam wybrać język polski. I wtedy będziecie Państwo słyszeć naszą tłumaczkę, panią Annę Wencel. Gdyby okazało się, że Państwo nie widzicie tej ikonki, to jest to związane z nieaktualną wersją Zooma. I wtedy trzeba wyłączyć Zuma, zaktualizować go do najnowszej wersji i ponownie się do nas to łączyć, czyli ikonka globusa na dole i wybór języka polski. Gdyby były jakieś problemy, to proszę pisać, ale w zasadzie jedynym problemem, który czasami się zdarza, to jak wspomniałem, nieaktualna wersja Zuma. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome, uh, welcome at the meeting. Uh, The meeting uh, will be held in, in English. Um, it will be also recorded and it's also live on the Facebook of the Galicia Jewish Museum. So you can pick uh, which channel you want to use um, to, to watch. Um, also, there are going to be, if, if we have time, time for questions. Uh, so um, please do write them in the chat. And again, if there will be uh, time, uh, I'm sure Adam, our guest and speaker will be happy to to address them. Um, so let us start. And again, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Adam Shorin, um, who is our speaker today, uh, a writer based in Warsaw. Uh, Adam, uh, for two years, served as the co-director of the Festival, an independent Jewish art collective in uh, Poland, based here in, in Kraków. He also works as a tour guide um, and educator with the Taubi Center for Jewish Life and Learning. Adam was also working for some time at the Galicia Jewish Museum, uh, which we are very uh, proud of. Um, Adam is a grandson of two Holocaust survivors. Um, originally from uh, New York, Adam spent some time uh, in Kraków uh, and now are uh, living in Warsaw. So, uh, Adam, I mean, um, how, how did it happen uh, that the New York uh, uh, boy ended up in, in Warsaw? You know, yeah, when I first moved to Poland, all my Polish friends would ask me, why did you, why did you give up New York? Uh, why did you give up the United States? And then as the Trump presidency continued, they, they stopped asking that question. No one was jealous of New York anymore. Um, I uh, moved here to, to work on a book. Um, my thesis in, at undergrad at university was a draft of a novel based on um, three generations of a family descended from Polish Jewish Holocaust survivors. And uh, I had gotten a grant to do research here in 2015 to, to start working on that book. And, and I wrote a draft of it as my thesis. When I graduated, I decided I, I, I wasn't done with it. Um, so I, I sort of looked for ways to come to Poland and keep doing that. And one of those ways was to uh, uh, start working for the Taube Foundation, uh, working here as doing in, in all sorts of capacities as an educator, as a tour guide, um, as an editor or assistant editor of uh, a Jewish studies periodical. Um, And in my time in Poland, then I sort of ended up doing a lot of, I've, I had done a lot of different things among them, uh, working as a co-director of Festival, which as you mentioned, is an independent Jewish arts collective, uh, interning briefly at the Galicia Jewish Museum and still occasionally leading tours there, um, working as a, as a translator 
uh, an editor for for all sorts of things, and and still all the while working on my book or doing doing research toward that. Um, and so I lived in Krakow for two years, and for the last uh, year or so, I've been living in Warsaw. Well, I mean, giving up uh, New York for Krakow, we, it's, it's natural. We, we've seen that pattern, but giving up New York for Krakow for Warsaw, that's uh, surprising. <laughs> that's, yeah, um, that's a tough one. But um, uh, what was, uh, when did you come to Poland for the first time? In 2004, I came with uh, my cousin and uh, my grandmother, both of whom I think are on this call, um, and, and my mom. Um, and it was sort of, um, in my memory, and maybe, maybe my cousin would disagree with me, it, it was sort of set up as a kind of like, this is important to see, to see your roots, to see where your family is from. Um, I grew up very close to my grandmother. I'm still very close to my grandmother. Um, and from the from from as early as I can remember, I've known that she survived the Holocaust. I've known that she uh, uh, was from Poland originally, that she survived in Siberia and then in Kazakhstan. And I, I didn't really think of her as Polish. I, I thought of her as, as Jewish, as a Jew who happened to be born in Poland, but could have, you know, for, could have been born anywhere. Uh, and just, it happened to be that she was from Poland and, um, you know, and that she was in this like Jewish enclave that, that existed sort of uh, uh, a geographically. Um, and, and, you know, and there, there were, the, the Polishness though was still kind of there. Like she would sing us lullabies in Polish. Um, there were, uh, and yeah, actually now that I'm living here, I've, I've learned a lot more about, um, I've started to see her much more as Polish. For one, we, we, we speak primarily in Polish when we talk on the phone, when we, when we FaceTime. Um, but for, for second, for two, I, all these expressions that my grandmother used my entire life that I, just, I thought were just like whimsical expressions that she came up with turn out to be like very common Polish <laughs> Polish idioms <laughs> that that my friends that my friends' parents use in Poland and I'm hearing in Polish and being like that sounds familiar and it's like oh it, I've heard it my entire childhood in in English coming from my grandmother and the, lots of the foods she would make you know that I always thought of as Jewish foods I'm seeing are also in, in some capacity Polish foods. So in 2004, um, we we came to Poland here. I can show you uh, what that looked like. Um, this is uh, my cousin Leah on, on the left, uh, me on the right. There's I'm wearing a fanny pack, I think, in all of the photos we have from this trip. And uh, my grandmother, Celia, in the center. And, and this is in... It's on the way to Dubienka, which is the village uh, she, my grandmother is from. Um, this is us in, in Krakow on Shiroka Street, which you know, is now a street that I, I know quite well, having given however many hundred plus tours of, of the area. Um, you know, looking at this image now, I, I'm, and I, it's not really answering your question, but I'm kind of struck by um, this impression I, I, I'd had of the, the, it's the, the fields, it's the fields of, of wheat or barley or grass or whatever in, in Eastern Poland that driving through them in 2015, which is the next time I was back in Poland after, after this moment, um, I, uh, I, I, I thought of with a lot of sadness, I, I thought of these fields as like death fields, right? Which I think is not uncommon for a lot, how a lot of people, a lot of American Jews coming to Poland feel. But I, I thought of these fields as like, I, I, would, I remember being in the car driving with uh, my friend Michał Wolfnia, who was driving, helping me get to, to Dubienka to, to visit it again and driving through these towns and being like, I know this, the name of this village because there was like a rabbi I had to learn about in middle school who was from this village or like, this is a famous village because I know there were Jews here. And of course we're driving through and there's no Jews and, and I'm thinking just like, oh, there's mass graves everywhere. 
and and I we got to my grandmother's hometown, and I had a similar impression to the one I had when I was um, when I was nine when I came in, in this photo in two thousand four, which was that um, the town was gone, right? That it that it was now this sad. Um, entity, like the sad nothing place that used to be that in my memory was like lively, Isaac Pasheva singer, kind of like magician of Lublin, fiddler on the roof, like everyone was like a, a magician or a card shark or like a, 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 a fiddler or a baker in my, <laughs> in my imagination. And we got there, you know, there's like one store. Um, it was like, like everything I saw in Poland, it felt very gray to me and very sort of just sad to imagine that like, it was like, here, this is where this amazing synagogue used to be. Like here, here are two stones from the synagogue and the rest of it's a bus stop or, you know, here's the Jewish cemetery. It used to be three times this size, but now the town dump is on part of it. There's like, um, uh, what's like a bulldozer tractor kind of thing on another part. And then there's a pile of broken headstones. Um, but strangely, and like I've, I've been building up to this but, I guess, is that the, the, the but is that now, after living here for some time, I, I, I sometimes I have that image of the sadness of the death of you know, everything. But I also have like a genuine affection <laughs> for these small Polish towns. Like I, I don't feel out of place in them in the way that I did in 2015 and in 2004. Um, in, in 2004, I, my mom found recently a journal I kept from the trip and I wrote, uh, I've told you this, I see you're laughing. I wrote, um, right now I like Krakow better than Dubienka, but in 1924, I would have liked Dubienka more. <laughs> like I was convinced that there was this shtetl magic world I had missed out on. And now like, I go through these small Polish towns if I'm like on a you know on a hiking trip and we're driving through small towns or just on a on a road trip or or just go on, on en route to somewhere else or maybe find a small town to, to spend the night in, and I'm like thrilled to talk to like the older women, you know, about the church they go to or like the recipe that they've passed down for whatever and to walk around the towns in the forest and like to see these um, you know really beautiful fields and and and. It's strange to have this connection to the 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 land, to this feeling of of the land in this photograph now that that isn't that's like a a religious <laughs> that isn't that isn't Jewish that is um, a connection to it as like just a beautiful place or or as a pole even, and um, that's something that's developed. So that was a very 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 long <laughs> answer to your question. No, but but you, you, when you said when you when you talked you said. Um, the memories, uh, the more memories of, of those places. And, you know, the, the funny thing is that, that I mean, these are not memories, yes, because uh, uh, that was your first time to Poland. That was, this is this imagination. And I'm kind of wondering whether whether this is, um, whether when coming for the first time to Poland, um, have you had already, I mean, has one of those images of either this this uh, Barshavi singer idealized, uh, you know, shtetl uh, uh, place, or this this graveyard uh, and, and and place uh, so much so heavily affected by the Holocaust. Whether one of those stories would be something that would be discussed at your family ha home before coming. I mean, whether your your grandparents uh, or, or parents were, were were talking about Poland, about Dubienka, about Krakow, in one of those uh, through one of those lenses, through one of those uh, stories. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, they, I'm saying like Isaac Pasheva singer and and Fiddler on the Roof, but really it's just from my grandmother's stories. It's it's uh, making cholent for for Shabbat, and you know, and they have to bring the pots of cholent, like this you know 24 hour stew, to um, the ice cream man who also has a bakery, and he's built the oven according to my grandmother because he wants people to be more religious and more observant. So he builds an oven so they don't, they don't have to cook at their homes on, on Shabbos and they put the cholent in the oven and they go home and, and the cherries and, you know, everyone, every Polish uh, immigrant to the U.S. of a certain age, of a certain generation I've met has talked about missing the, the Polish cherries, right? Because in Poland, there's two cherries. There's like what we think of as cherries in the U.S. And then there's the bitter cherries that you use for, um, you know, for, for, for pastries and things. And um, 
there's I in, in college I read a memoir from like 1904 of a Polish immigrant to the U.S. and she and you know and she wrote it so she wrote it in like 1904 she immigrates in the, the, I think the late 1800s and she has a whole section about missing these cherries and I was like oh I had never heard at that point hadn't heard it addressed anywhere else and I was like my whole childhood my grandmother would say you know you just can't get the fruit like this so so to me it was this mythical place it was like uh, it had a funny name, Dubienka. It was the river Bug, which which sounded weird. Like I knew it was. It spelled bug. It spelled bug in English. It spelled bug in Polish. But but I knew that it was pronounced Bug, which which felt like in, in another element of like connection to it that I, that I could pronounce it differently than how another American child would. And and yeah, and these stories of of her father, who was the amazing tailor, and. Uh, uh, you know, skipping rope and, and of course, and then of the Nazis arriving and, and, you know, but at that same year, so actually right before going on this trip, I had recorded my grandmother telling her story. I, I have the tapes somewhere. They're like little cassette tapes and they're listed like Dubienko one to four. Mm. And I just asked her a lot of questions. And, and at that point, even, I mean, like now there's sections of her story that all of us in my family could say from Roth. Um, and I had meant as well, you know, I, I, my, I didn't grow up knowing my grandfather as well, um, uh, my grandmother's ex-husband, Richard. Um, but, and I knew that he was a survivor. I knew he was from Krakow. His story was more of a mystery to me. And, and of course I was like, oh, one day I'll go and I'll film him and, and record him. And then when I was, he passed away when I was 16 and at that point like even like that the year before I was like oh this summer I should go and film Richard talking about about his childhood and then I and then I never, never did and it's only after he's died that I've that I've sort of tracked down video and testimony and things to, to learn more. So, so tell us more about your grandmother I mean Today, in, uh, I mean, this this month, March is is the month when uh, we're in Krakow. We, we commemorate the anniversary of both establishment of the ghetto and liquidation of the ghetto. So the story of Richard is interesting for us from from that particular point of view. But um, I had a pleasure and privilege of, of 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 to know your 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 grandmother, however beautifully, but but I did spoke with with her, and she is absolutely ex extraordinary person. So could you tell us a bit more about her story? Uh, yeah. How did she survive the war? Yeah, she is an extraordinary person. Um, you know, and growing up, she was like my superhero. She was the, uh, she was always, she was the best doctor, the best cook, the best everything. Like, like there was nothing she could do wrong. Um, and she, so she was born in Dubyanka, which is a town that today is on the border with Ukraine, but at the time would have been in central Poland. And, um, on September 1st, 1939, uh, the Germans invaded Poland. And on September 17th, the Soviets invaded and they split up the country. And the uh, boundary line was right next to Dubienka um, along at that point along the river Bug. So she, had, she was uh, then in German occupied Poland and across the river was Soviet occupied Poland. And uh, one day there was an announcement that all the Jews had to come to the square and this is the German side. And uh, as my grandmother <laughs> tells it, her mother said, we're not going. And, you know, and her father said, but you just received, you just got this cabinet that you've been waiting on for three years for them to make this cabinet. And she goes, like, we're not going. And um, they, she arranged it with a guy uh, to, called in, in the story, the Ganeth, which means the thief in Yiddish. Or, or uh, you know, and my, my grandmother says, um, it was called the Ganef because he was a horse trader by profession and, and horse trading is not a, uh, a Jewish profession. Um, you know, and that I've also learned since then that horse trader in English and Yiddish and Polish is just, is an expression that you use for someone who's like shady at business, right? And so who knows what the man's profession was, but this is who he was in the story. And, and they arranged it with him that he would ferry them across the river into Soviet occupied Poland. Um, like many Jews, many Polish Jews actually fled at the time from German occupied Poland to Soviet occupied Poland. And Stalin in, in the early months of 1940 
um, treated them as Nazi spies and had them sent to Siberia. Um, and so she ended up in a gulag in, in Siberia near the town of Irkutsk, near the city of Irkutsk. And um, near, I mean, in relative terms, like hours away, <laughs> but, but in Siberia, that's close. And, um, and survived there for some amount of time. It's a, about two years is, is the estimation. Uh, her brother died there from meningitis. Um, and in 1942, uh, they were sent then to Kazakhstan, where she sat out the remainder of the war in a prisoner's village of, of you know, mud huts and, and hot desert sun. Um, yeah, and and that's the, those are the those are the, the, the those are the war periods. After the war, she became a doctor, went to medical school in Bern, uh, where she met my grandfather. And then uh, for 50 plus years, practice as a doctor in New York. So, so your, your, your grandmother came from a rather small place, um, while your grandfather, Richard, that you mentioned already, came from, uh, from Krakow, from a slightly or uh, quite different um, environment of a of, uh, big city, uh, a very assimilated family. Can you tell us more about Richard now? Yeah, sure. Um, Richard. Um was born Oscar, Oscar, Oscar Richard Oris in, in 1923 in Krakow. Um, grew up in a, an assimilated family. His, on his mother's side, his, his grandfather ran a kosher sausage business. And in his testimony, Richard says, but the non-kosher were better. <laughs> um, he, uh, you know, growing up there, um, when the war began, there's a sort of panic of what they would do. Uh, in 1940, he, he the, the, the Jewish hospital in Krakow, uh, very close to the Relice Jewish Museum today, um, had this kind of kind of astonishing moment of uh, foresight to create an accelerated nursing program uh, so that they could, um, you know, people could become nurses within a year. And so Richard took that program, took part in that program which is part of what saved him because in the ghetto, he became a nurse. Um, so he was in the Krakow ghetto from uh, probably from 1942 to 1943. Um, and then in early 43 was sent to Płaszów, which is a concentration camp uh, in the city of Krakow. Um, and he was there for about two years until January, I wanna say January 14th, 1945. And he was in the last group of prisoners who were marched out of Plashev. Um, and then so for the final months of the war was kind of shuttled around between different camps um, in this sort of desperate period as, as the Germans were kind of aware they were losing the war. And um, so, you know, disease was rampant, supp supplies were, were short, and he was in um, Sachsenhausen, uh, Flossenburg, Obertraubling, which is a subcamp of Flossenburg, and finally in Dachau. And he, he was in Dachau for about a week. Mm. And uh, uh, he, that's where he was liberated uh, by the Americans. And he also ended up in the States. Um, and I mean, every story, every Holocaust story, uh, or story of the Holocaust survivor is unique in, in and fascinating, and both Celia, Celia and Richard gave testimonies after the war, and and, uh, and one can learn more about those details. But um, the, the story is, is getting um, different in terms of Richard, because unlike um, most of the Holocaust survivors, those that survived the war, um, either never returned to Poland or came back to Poland briefly right after the war to find out that Poland is not a place that is welcoming them with, with open uh, arms. They've been um, facing uh, anti-Semitism, violence, uh, of course, destruction, poverty, and, and all other sorts of, 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 of troubles and horrible things, which, which um, resulted in, in the fact that most of those Holocaust survivors that even briefly came back to Poland uh, left uh, in, the, in the matter of, of the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and most of them never returned or, or did not return for many, many years to come. But that's not uh, not true for Richard. Richard, um, despite the, the, the horrible thing and despite the trauma and pain, 
did return to Poland uh, quite soon. Yeah, um, well, uh, the, the example you give of, Paul, of Paul's encounter of Jews returning and encountering that they were not welcome is, is sort of what my grandmother experienced. Like, as she tells it, they got off the train in Krakow and, and a Polish woman said, what? There's, there's so many Jews still left. And so they turned around and or they, you know, they kept going and, and they, they went to a DP camp. And Richard, you know, he returned to Krakow and, and decided not to settle there, right? Like he could have stayed in Krakow after the war, but he went with, his, with a woman who was going to be, who had become his first wife, uh, Irena Keller, to a DP camp and, and with her sister to a DP camp in Switzerland. Um, eventually went to medical school in Switzerland as well, which is where I met my grandfather. It's how he ended up in the US. But once he was in the US, yeah, he, he started coming to Poland quite frequently, um, bringing his kids, uh, bringing his, his wife, whoever his wife was at the time, um, and, and, you know, which in, in the different groups of kids. And um, yeah, this was unique. I actually, I can show you um, some photos. Uh, so before even this one, I had, so this is uh, Richard and Celia, I probably in med school or maybe soon thereafter, maybe at the, uh, in, in New York at a Halloween party. And um, it's Richard and I'll get to that in a second, but yeah, Richard would come back quite frequently. Um, here they are, here he is with my mother and her uh, brother and sister in 1967. Um, and then about 25 years later, someone who's on the chat could correct me. <laughs> David is, is here. So this is David, uh, my uncle, and uh, Nina, my half aunt, um, uh, Richard, Richard's daughter. And, you know, it's sort of the same pose. These two photos are kind of extraordinary together because um, it was important, right? It, it, and, and, and he stand, I, I, if this is the key photo of his visits back to Krakow, he's not standing in front of the high synagogue. You know, he, to him, Kozimiesz was a shtetl. Like it was, why, why go to the poor Jewish shtetl? Like, like he's standing in front of Mariatsky Church. He's standing in front of like the symbol of, of Catholic uh, Krakow. And, uh, you know, he, he would take these, actually, I spoke a little too soon about that because he, he, of course, was investigating or, or was recording um, things that had to do with Jewishness. Um, I'll show you very briefly. I have a, a short clip of, from, from the 1970s. Um, if you'd like me to play it now, I don't know if now's a good time. But it's, yeah, uh, please go ahead. So it's probably, my, my guess is that this is from the year, uh, my guess is it's from either autumn, no, my guess is it's from early 1971. Uh, and second. So this is in the New Jewish Cemetery in Krakow, which um, Richard helped raise money to uh, renovate. And, you know, these are places I, the, I know this so well. This, I'll pause it very briefly. Dr. Neusenfeld, um, it says here in Polish that he was the head doctor of the um, Jewish hospital, he was the rector of the Jewish hospital. Uh, you know, this is the guy who my grandfather served under in, in the Krakow ghetto, who actually helped save my grandfather from a deportation. Um, and so it's striking to just, I don't know, to see, to see him recording these things. And he's there on, on, you know, his Super 8 camera that we saw him holding before. This street, I, I've walked by this street I don't know, 5,000 times. Like it, it's sort of funny to see, I'm, I'm glad almost that I get to see these videos that I've, I've only started seeing these videos very recently. I saw this for the first time a week ago. Um, I'm glad to see them having lived for two years in Krakow, like the festival headquarters are around the corner, you know, right, right out of frame on the left is, is a sushi place where, uh, which is in the building that, that uh, the kosher sausage factory was in. And then here's Vavo. And, you know, he's like, it's, it's funny in these videos that he's like going to see Jewish things and in a different video clip, he goes to Auschwitz. Um, and then he's also like, like any tourist, <laughs> like just taking video of, of the, the, the main sites in, in uh, Krakow and in Warsaw. You know, looking at this photo, one, one um, really um, 
is struggling to to understand both i mean the reality of of first of all of poland i mean the, if that's uh, as you say early 70s uh, i mean this is still Poland behind the iron cart in as a cart in a communist yeah. country two years or, or a couple of years after anti-semitic purge of 1967 1968 uh, so not really a country uh, that is first of all i mean easily accessible and second of all uh, um obvious destination especially i mean uh, on top of that of course again richard um Richard had uh, probably brought with him all those um, horrible memories of, of, of the war. Uh, his mother and his sister were killed, taken away from, from the ghetto. Yeah. Uh, during the, one of the deportations. So do you have a kind of uh, idea of, of what was bringing him in back? I mean, whether that was research or documentation? No, I don't think it was that. I think it's, um, you know, he, he thought of himself as Polish, right? He thought of himself as, as Polish, and then he, like, happened to be Jewish. And um, so I just paused on this image because I think it's extraordinary. I think this is such a wild thing to capture of just, like, these kids playing and one kid is, like, posing dead. I, I don't know. I just think it's fantastic. Um, and, yeah, of course, he's like, capturing the nuns, interested in nuns. This is Linda, his third wife, and, and you know, filming her walking around Krakow. Um, to answer the question, um, I'll keep, I'll, I guess I'll keep the video going. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I read, I read a book recently, I read, like last week where a Polish Jewish survivor living in the UK, um, says he might get Irish, uh, I'll pause it on the Warsaw section here, says he might get, uh, Irish citizenship. And he can relate to the Irish because we Poles know what it means to be persecuted. And I thought this was such an extraordinary comment from a Polish Jew, <laughs> like 20 years after the Holocaust, less than that, you know, 15 years after the Holocaust to say, right, that we, as, as that I as a Pole know what it means to be persecuted. And I think to some degree, Richard had this mentality of like, Yes, I, I suffered for being Jewish, and, and I, I and there were certain cultural Jewish things that were very important to him. But he was Polish. Um, there, at one point, uh, my uncle says that he he said to his dad, he said to Richard, "Oh, you you sound like a tourist, you know, when you speak English." And he said, "I feel like a tourist <laughs> living in the U.S." And there's something of this of just like like he never stop missing his homeland. He never stopped missing his hometown. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing to balance these sort of horrible memories of being in the ghetto, of being in Poshuv, I mean, in the city. It's not like Poshuv, it's not like he was taken far away to go to Poshuv. Like he probably, at some point in his childhood, visited the Jewish cemetery in where Poshuv was. Uh, or, or at least, you know, like went for a walk in, in Shimyonki and over the hills there. I mean, there's photos he took in in, in uh, the ghetto where he's standing on the hills that like continue into becoming Plashev. So it's not like he was he experienced the horrors of the camp in some faraway place. Um, but I, I don't know if it's compartmentalizing. I don't I don't know how to I don't want to like um, <laughs> get too much into the psychology of it. I think it was just he loved Poland and had this very strong love for the place that he could have at the same time as having these these memories um you know and and when he was when he was dying um or near the end of his life when, when he had pretty severe dementia and you know we, i would visit him with my mom and he would say like six or seven times in the conversation so like very very thick polish accent i won't even i won't try to try to replicate it he would say so michelle like what are you doing and she'd be like oh i'm a lawyer <laughs> or, like, or oh i'm i'm you know working in development now and then by the end, and, and in my memory, I don't, maybe she'll correct me in, in the chat. In my memory, she said at one point, like he asks her for like the six or seven times, and she's like, I, I, I work for NASA. I'm an astronaut. And he goes, oh, that's very interesting. And like, it doesn't matter. And then he asks her again a few minutes later. And so he could barely hold a conversation about anything current. But then you would ask him about Krakow, and he could, it was like he would take you around the city place by place. Like he could remember, you know, he remembered everything from his childhood very, very intensely. And um, I don't know, I think that's a strong, um, a very strong connection to the place. Mm -hmm. And is that, is that connection that, that clearly Richard felt um, um, 
extremely uh, in, in terms of, 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 of the history of other Holocaust survivors. Um, kind of fast forwarding to, to your work and life in Poland these days, is that something that you find um, present among the visitors, uh, American Jews or, or foreigner, foreigners uh, with Jewish roots coming to Poland today? Is there, is there some kind of similar sentiment? Mo- mostly thing? not, no. Mostly, and you know, I've had a lot of experience taking um, primarily Jewish groups uh, around uh, different parts of Krakow or different parts of Poland. And no, there's, there's, it's usually not this feeling of connection for the children. You know, I, I, I haven't, I've toured one person who grew up, who was actually from Poland and, the, and survived and, you know, lived uh, in the U.S., but mostly it's, it's people who are the children or grandchildren of um, survivors, if they have any connection to Poland, uh, any familial connection. And no, there's not that feeling. I remember very clearly on one student group um, at the end of the trip, we asked them like, so what stood out to you the most? And one kid said, um, I was just so struck and I was so hurt by being in Warsaw and seeing people walk past the Warsaw Ghetto Monument uh, Memorial and just like, just keep walking, like not even paying attention to it. And I, un- I understand that like you, you, it feels h- hard when something's very emotional for you and you see people just walking by it. Like I, I live in Warsaw. I don't like stop in Zykotish every time I walk by the memorial. I just like need to get somewhere and I walk by it. You know, it was the same in Krakow. There's this very moving monument to the liquidation of the ghetto in the Umschlagplatz in the, in the Umschlagplatz, how you say it, like deportation mm-hmm. square, deportation site of the, uh, of ghetto and it's this moving monument of 68 empty chairs to symbolize the furniture that people brought with them to be deported thinking that they would go and and have like their next meal with this furniture or their next you know shabbat dinner they'd be sitting on these chairs and they left it behind and they're either killed or deported or sent to auschwitz like right it's, it's this very moving monument and like I'm running by being like, oh, I need to catch the tram or like, oh, I, I, I have to, do, my friend lives around the corner and to get here. And I think that's, um, you know, and so I was very struck by this kid saying like, how can people treat it this way? Cause I was like, I, I kind of do. Like, I don't, I don't feel this like mournful thing. It, it can be just a place. I, what I've said to you several times about my, my own connection is that it's not like, like I lived in Krakow like around, the corner from one of one of the apartments my grandfather lived in before the war. Like literally, if, if I was a better, if I had a better arm, I could maybe almost throw something and hit it, maybe a little ambitious. And, um, you know, like a, like a two minute walk. And so it, meaning that like I, some several routes that I took every day were also like crisscrossing routes that he took every day for years. And when I say it now, it's like, oh, that's pretty meaningful. But like, of course, at the time, I'm not really thinking of it. But but I had in my head kind of always while living in Krakow, um, both this apartment, not his other apartments, I don't know why, but this apartment and the synagogue where he was bar mitzvah, which is the high synagogue that I was, I, I, I just, it, it's kind of like um, if you're in New York, you know, you, you, you always sort of know where the Empire State Building is, like you can always kind of point in that direction. Um, or if you're in Paris, you can always like sort of point to where the Eiffel Tower is. Like that, that's how I, I felt with, with these landmarks of my grandfather. Like I, I, I wasn't thinking about it constantly. I wasn't in like a constant state of like mourning or like reflection. You know, I had my own um, connection to these places, but I could always sort of turn and be like, oh, I know where that is. Um, yeah. So, so it seems that y- your personal connection with Poland is is quite complicated one. Um, somewhere between the, the life of your grandparents and in terms of Krakow uh, grandfather and your own life. So so w- what does Poland mean for you? I yeah. mean, is it a place, contemporary place or, or the past place or... Yeah, I, after I finish this call, I'm actually going to, to a friend's house to, to watch 
a movie about Jamil uh, Bitsana about a, um, the, the promised land, about a Pole and a Jew and a German who come together to to make a business in Poland. Um, and I, but I, I bring them up because this past summer, one of them asked me, like, do you have any, like, do, do you feel anything about Poland that isn't Holocaust related, that isn't Jewish related? And I was kind of like, it's like, it's like, what do you like in Poland, you know, aside from the places, but in like the culture? And for me, it was really this, this sort of like, like the weird art kind of, of, of like communist era Poland. There this, to, to, to phrase it, I guess, more, more precisely, is that at no point in Poland's history um, was there not a large segment of the population that hated the, 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 the powers that be, the ruling authority. Um, in the 1800s, writers wrote novels about, you know, like princes and knights and kings or whatever, um, and animals that were that were uh, called Aesopian novels because they were all allegorical. They were all like really critiquing uh, the Russian Empire, for example. Or uh, during Nazism, you know, in the in the basements of the main square in Krakow, uh, which today are like horrible, upsetting bars or nightclubs or pizzerias. Or I wish there was a pizzeria. <laughs> it's like these really trashy, uh, you know, venues. Um, during communism, like John Paul II, before he was even a priest, was like going there as a young actor to, to read out plays. And they were having like secret actors studios during communism, during, sorry, during Nazism, during the occupation in the center of Krakow, uh, which is extraordinary. And, uh, and then during communism, obviously, there's, there's underground presses, there's underground, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're printing uh, records, like music records from the West on, on x-rays from hospitals, you know, Sami's dot records. Like there's all these, uh, there's all this underground art. There's all this art that's being censored, but then has like secret coded meetings into it. Um, and so I was always very drawn to that. I, I went, when, when uh, Trump was elected in, in, the, in the US, I remember there was like a big call among, you know, artists and writers on the West Coast of like, now is the time to resist. Like now we turn our work, our, our, we, 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 we make work that's political and we don't ignore it. And it was like in Poland, there was never a need to, to say that. Like art in Poland has always, you know, been tied to a, to a state of resistance. <laughs> and uh, so that's something I'm very, that was a very roundabout way of saying, like there's something that, that, that appeals to me in Poland and in Polish culture that is completely unrelated or you know, somewhat unrelated from, from Jewishness here. Um, you asked about, having a relationship to this place that's between my grandparents and, and, and myself. You know, I'm very skeptical of people like me, of like um, third gen people uh, who, who describe their relationship to these places as if they're protagonists in their grandparents' stories, you know? Like <laughs> what happened to them happened to them. They have their stories. I grew up hearing those stories and, and my relationship to these places is sort of like, like in, the, in the story in which I'm the protagonist, it's, it's through having heard those stories and being thinking about their stories my whole life. And I come here and I'm thinking about them being in these places, but I also have, you know, a separate relationship to them, a separate life, especially in Warsaw, neither of my grandparents lived here. You know, to my my grandmother was like, oh, it was the big city. Like, like I was I was a country bumpkin. I wouldn't like I felt out of place in Warsaw. And I I feel like I like I love Warsaw. I know as a Krakowian, that's maybe a difficult thing for you to to face, but but I, I really love this city. And um it's nice to have that relationship to this place that feels entirely not connected to to Jewishness, to my family, to anything like that. Well, you, you talk about those histories, the, the history of the past and, and, and your relation. And you're um, at the Galicia Jewish Museum. We're working on, on the new temporary exhibition that uh, will be talking uh, also about that. Um, can you tell us more about that, that project? You're a member of the Curiatoria uh, team that is preparing that, uh, that exhibition. Sure. Um, so... As you said, we're, we're, we're preparing an exhibit now at the Galicia Museum. Um, it's 
as a starting point, taking uh, you know Richard's. Well, I should say, I should say R Richard took his whole life was taking photographs in the ghetto. He took photographs. Um, I can show you, I'll just show you some of them. Um, you know, there's the footage I've showed you of his visits to Poland. Um, there's uh, these pre-war photographs. Like this is an extraordinary photograph to me. He's in the ghetto with a friend. You can see the ghetto wall in the background. You can see the armband he's wearing that Jews had to wear. And they look like they're on like a fun vacation almost, <laughs> or like they're posing for like a college, I don't know, yearbook photo. And, and I've always been moved by like photos like this. Like I, my, my mom printed this for me for my birthday a couple of years ago. Cause I, I, you know, we're looking through these photos that we have this like mass archive of, of family photos of relatives who were killed during the war of like Richard's notes or my mom's notes in the back of them of like this person committed suicide, this person was murdered, this person, this. And then you also have like photos like this. And, and there is a, a real, I, I, have, I, I don't even have the tools to articulate it really, but there's a sort of mystery to it of, of like just, uh, yeah, of, of him looking at a sunflower, of him looking at a, like it's not a, looking at a flower. I'm getting off topic. You asked about the exhibition. So the exhibition takes as its starting point, um, not just someone who's experienced these things in, in, in Poland um, as a survivor, but has also come back to Poland uh, all these times, which was, as we've said, is quite, unique and, and who continued to have a relationship with Poland, even, even from abroad. Um, and then we're looking at sort of like how that relationship to this place exists and also how uh, Richard and, and also my grandmother's stories have trickled down through the generations, how my mom and her siblings and half siblings uh, relate to this material, relate to these narratives um, and how I and my siblings and my cousins relate to this history. And like all of us obviously relate to it in, in different ways. Um, that was a very <laughs> roundabout answer that I kind of say what the exhibition's about. Is there more you think I should say or that you want to say? Well, no, I, I think that it, it's kind of uh, encapsulates um, the, the, the theme uh, of, of the exhibition, which will be about relations um, complicated relations uh, with, with Poland, and I think that your um, family story is is interesting, is unique for us because it's it's um, not frozen in time, as we see in many many other cases. Um, despite the trauma, you, you, your family been been coming and talking about Poland, coming to Poland in relation with Poland, uh, which is not um, which has not ended. And I think this is um, the questions of, of why, uh, what it is that you are looking for uh, in, in this relation uh, um, are extremely interesting and, and important, especially, in, I think, when when the there is uh, the number of Holocaust survivors, those that remember Poland or in, in, in general Eastern Europe or pre the old country, pre-war Europe is, is dwindling. Um, because the question is what this relation, the future relations, will be based on. Um, is that is, is that story? I mean, from your your experience of, of being in Poland, working uh, with groups, uh, working with festival, which is which is looking at Polish Jewish relations uh, as well. Is that story also interesting or important for the? Sorry, can, you, can you repeat the question? I, I, I missed the beginning. Is that story of of, of Polish? Jewish relations, uh, from your experience, important also for the non-Jews? I mean, what, do, you, do you encounter non-Jews interested in those stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah I'll, I'll move away from this photo one second. Um, I do encounter non-Jews interested in this stuff. Um, I forget who originally said, I think Agi Lugutko, um was quoting someone, maybe it's a Raphael Scharf comment, maybe you know who said this thing about the phantom lamb. Or that the that Jews, do you know who said it? Who who coined the phrase originally? No. It's this the, the idea is that um, after the war and after communism, when, when there's very few Jews left in Poland, um, non-Jewish Poles have kind of like a phantom pain or a phantom limb where where an essential part of themselves is missing and they still feel like the pain of it, you know, in relation to Jews. Um, 
Pavel Poplikovsky has said many, many times about his film Ida, about a nun discovering she has Jewish roots, that it's not a film about Polish-Jewish relations, it's a film about what it means to be Polish. Um, that, that you, you know, if you, are, if you are Polish, this is something, that this is a story that is here, that is, that is, that is part of you. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of the work we do with Festival, uh, with this Jewish Arts Collective, is working with um, you know, non-Jews. Um, people ask me all the time if I encounter anti-Semitism here. Uh, and I don't really, um, I maybe encounter things that are like, I'm like, oh, that makes me uncomfortable, but like not, it's rare that I encounter like flat out anti-Semitism. What I, what I do encounter more commonly and what, what makes me uncomfortable in a different way is, is what, um, some people have termed philo-Semitism, um, which is, you know, if I tell someone I'm Jewish, I'm like, that is so interesting. You know, I love Israel. And I'm like, well, I have a complicated relationship to that place. Like, like they're like, oh, but it is so amazing. And Hebrew is such a beautiful language. And, you know, and there's this, I, I don't want to uh, throw a particular establishment under the bus, but there is a, a chain of, of Israeli style uh, restaurants in Warsaw and, and a few other cities as well, um, where I've walked in and like, there's Hebrew on the wall and there's like final letters in Hebrew in the middle of a word or like you walk in and it says, uh, which means the life strawberries. Like it's not a phrase, <laughs> it's not a real thing. And, and I, you know, asked, I was, so it's just like, he, it's just Hebrew gibberish on the walls, but there's like a cool factor to it. Uh, and that's been something that's been like endlessly perplexing to me and interesting, um, you know, that, that, I, that I think about a lot. Thank you. Um, so so the, the exhibition will be on, um, will be open in the end of uh, August uh, this summer. So, so we hope that it will be possible for all of you to, to come and see it. Uh, and it, it will be on for, um, for almost a year until the summer of 2022. Uh, um, so now I see we have some questions in the chat. And is it okay for us to take yeah, some questions? Yeah, questions. Um, so I don't know if you see them, but I can... Let me open one second. Mm -hmm. I have them. Sure. Um, scrolling down. Oh, so there's one question from Dan Budowski. Great. It's a, that's, that's always a, a nice name to see at the top of a question. Um, Adam... Kuba mentioned that your memories are not really memories since they are not your own, but rather imaginations. I should say to clarify that I, I meant to say, I, I didn't mean to say memories if I said memories about the shtetl. I meant to, be, I meant to say how I imagined it. Um, and you explain how you're skeptical of those in your situation who place themselves as protagonists in the stories of prior generations. Finally, the name of today's talk is Rememories, implying that these stories can only be told as reinterpretations. How, if at all, do you reconcile this with a familiar plea to never forget and the human desire to soften the blow of difficult memories? It's a good question where we're talking about memory in kind of like two different ways, right? Where like the never forget is like, how do we maintain a collective memory? And the human desire is like, how do we as individuals um, not live in the uh, uh, trauma of, of our worst memories? Um, I'll say I'm very skeptical of the phrase uh, "never, never forget." Um, mostly because because I, I, I'm not. I, I well, <laughs> this is maybe a longer talk, but I I I just don't see it as like being effective. If the goal of never forget is to not let these atrocities be repeated, then like why have genocides happened since then? <laughs> why why are you know I, I I I it feels like a thing that we can say that doesn't have honestly much meaning in, in how it's enacted. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's maybe a different rant, but um, I think there's, I mean, let me process for a second more. Yeah, I, I, for one thing, Daniel, like they're not my, my, it's hard almost for me to answer because because they're not memories that I have to soften the blow of, right? Like I I don't begrudge um, obviously Holocaust survivors who 
move away from it and don't want to talk about it ever again, which for many years, both, you know, both my grandparents didn't want to talk about it for a long time, which is, which is quite common and, you know, of, of for people returning to the stories as, as they get older. Um, so that's part of it is like, I don't, it's not a blow that I have to soften for myself. I, there's even things around the Holocaust or around maybe sort of the, the, what to me, what I think is an interesting like element of kitsch in play, some ways the Holocaust is treated in Poland and in Germany today, that for me is interesting. And to like my mom as like a second gen person uh, feels, um, uh, you know, more upsetting because she feels closer to the story. Oh, you say, what, what you mean is do Poles seek to avoid guilt for their role? This is, this is the, the easily the number one question I get. Um, on tours. Um, this is a very, very, very complicated question. Um, we could talk more about what the role of polls was. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's a strange moment in Poland today as this conversation about guilt and suffering and victimhood is becoming more and more central uh, to a current debate, even though this is something that happened that you know, as we're going further and further away from it in time. Um, it's a yes and no question. Like there's a lot of Poles who, who want to recount, you know, atrocities that Poles committed uh, during the war against their Jewish neighbors. Um, and there's a lot that want to cover it up. I should say, you know, um, it's a what, what part of what makes it such a difficult debate is that Poland is a country that, um, you know, is, it has more uh, uh, righteous among the nations, you know, people recognized by Yad Vashem for, for saving Jews than any other country. Poland is the only country during the war that established uh, a governmental organization devoted to saving Jews. Like not the UK, not Norway, not France, Poland did this. Um, you know, risking, uh, uh, people are risking their lives every day trying to save Jews during the war. And at the same time, you know, the, the flip side to that is you might say, well, of course, Poland should have the most like righteous among the nations. That's where the most Jews were killed. And in fact, recent research has shown that the majority of Jews who were hiding in the shtetls of central Poland were ratted out or killed by their neighbors. Um, and it's a very murky question, it's a very tricky question, because you had people who at some point in the war maybe killed or ratted out a Jewish neighbor to the, to the German authorities and then later saved the Jew, or you have someone who was who hid someone for a long time and then later killed them or killed someone else. So it's, it, 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 to get into the actual what of what happened is, is much trickier. I would say the majority of, majority of non-Jewish Poles, and maybe Kuba, I, I, I imagine you agree with me, the majority of non-Jewish Poles, you know, didn't risk their lives to save Jews, nor did they go out of their way to kill Jews. The majority tried to distance themselves from what was happening as much as possible, right? Poles were occupied as well. This is how a, a, a non-Jewish, uh, sorry, a Polish Jewish survivor in London in the 50s is saying, we Poles were persecuted. You know, it means as well that, that Poles were targeted, that Poles were killed. For the first year of the occupation, actually, non-Jewish Poles were targeted at a much higher rate than Jewish Poles. The sort of the statistical result though is that nine out of 10 Jewish Poles were killed and one out of 10 non-Jewish Poles were killed. That was, oh, thanks for wonderful responses. I'm glad I thought I was going on for a very long time. So Kuba, do you have, I, I think I, I think I, nothing I said there I would disagree with, I think, right? It's free, um, maybe up to five years in prison, uh, according to Willows. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, yeah, yeah. Now, now this is online. <laughs> I didn't even mention the, the Holocaust law. Quote unquote. So, so we can no, no, no. I think I think uh, you, all, all, all the things that you said were 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 were, um, were right, and I at the same time just just let me add that I think it, for the polls it was while I, I agree that for a big part of the population probably the the reaction would be to stay as far as possible from what's what was happening. It was at the same time polls that that couldn't really be. Um, it was hardest to be far away because of the proximity of the killing, like uh, in Germany or France or Hungary, which you know we know about uh, 500,000 Hungarian Jews um, killed, uh, sent to Auschwitz. Uh, uh, most of those were not killed 
where they lived, while in Poland, a uh, big part of the of the victims were killed precisely where they lived in, in the broad uh, daylight. So this it was very difficult to stay um, out of, of what was, what was happening. And um, I think that kind of also influenced the, the further relations. But uh, let's go back to the questions. Um, I can answer, I mean, Harold Moskowitz, I, mean, I can answer more quickly, which was as a, as a Jew whose family suffered so much, you must encounter Poles who lived and participated in the Holocaust. I mean, no, because, you know, it was a long time ago. So it's, there's very few people who were old enough to, to, to also then kill someone else at the time. Um, the people who I've talked to who have had family members who participated in killing, uh, talk like like for them it's like discovering something like it's it's a hard thing right it's, it's a difficult thing and they're they're mostly trying to unearth as much as they can about it there was a long what what um is, is there a what's the english translation for his mother milchenia like like collusion of silence and agreement of silence like i but there's a term in english um for like I don't know, tacit acceptance. There, for, for, for a long time, there was a sort of hush of referring to specific perpetrators in this sense. There were uh, massacres of, of Jews by, perpetrated by non-Jewish Poles in, in a few towns in the summer of 1941. And in at least one of those towns for decades, for decades, the monument commemorating that massacre referred to um, fascists killing the Jews, right? Like, and people who had participated in the massacre continued to live in the town and walk by it every day. So it was just a lot of it was stuffed under the rug. And so for the relatives of people who maybe participated in those things, um, there's a sort of grappling with like inherited guilt. There's a trying to figure out what it means, um, trying to often trying to share the story. So let's take uh, uh, one last question, uh, and I see um, it's here. Do you see a difference between second and generation versus your generation, how they are both interpreting and accepting this history? And if so, can you be a bit more specific about how and why? Um, yeah, good question, Foster. Um, I think one difference is just that like by having more distance, I'm, I, I'm, it's well, it's one having more distance and two, like also having less distance as not by generation, but by the fact that I, I immerse the, you know, most of the work I do in Poland has to do with Jews or the Holocaust in some way. And so um, I uh, uh, sort of am numb to a lot of things. Um, and at the same time, I'm not as close to them. So I can hear, I think, I think there's some things that my mom or her siblings would be like, I don't know, I, I, I can't, you know, you're asking for a specific example. And I, I don't really have one. Um, in terms of how uh, interpreting and accepting this history, I guess, I guess one thing I can say is that I grew up like, like from before I can remember anything. My first thing I know that I knew was that my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor and I knew her story. And my mom and her siblings described, and her half siblings described their childhood. And, and it's a lot of like hushed things. It's a lot of like, they don't wanna talk about this. We're not gonna ask them about this right now. Like, and this is very common, right? Like you see it also with Vietnam vets who serve in Vietnam, experience horrible things, and then work for 50 years. And, and they're, not, they're not focusing on what they experience. And then as grandparents, where they both feel, where they have like more time on their hands because not working as much. And they also have a new generation that they wanna pass this story on to start to talk about it more. This is pretty common. Um, a lot of survivors started telling their stories in the nineties, which is when my grandparents did as well. So I think maybe that is one thing is that I grew up sort of always knowing, at least from my grandmother, the story. Uh, that's a good question in terms of the exhibition that, that we're working on um, and, and um... I hope that uh, the exhibition will be talking also about that, about the, the changing attitude. Yeah. Um, and uh, to Poland, to Jewish Poland, 
uh, and about uh, this this trauma that is passed on 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 the new new generations, um, and and. Uh, I think that you know, it, of course, there are other stories related to 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 what we talked about today. Uh, with us um, is uh, as a as a as a listener, uh, Mr. Bernard Offen, who is also from Krakow, a Holocaust survivor that is also coming back every every summer oh, to, yeah. to Krakow. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, recently we had a meeting with with, with Bernard um, for for uh, Polish and international. Uh, youth. So, um, so we hope that those stories and then the questions uh, about what brings people like Bernard, like uh, like other Holocaust survivors, second generation, third generation, are important. Also, I think it's important for us um, because um, as a as a non-Jewish Pole, I um, often uh, see among the Poles um, this this anxiety and lack of understanding of what it is that is bringing those people back. I mean, there is lots of fear, um, feeling of, of, of guilt, remorse, uh, uh, but also um, this this uh, feeling of, of opportunity for the first time to, uh, to often, in terms of smaller places, to have a meaningful discussion with someone that is from, um, from here, um, but has been disconnected. And I think this is something that we've been encountering uh, quite often. Um, that people are want to speak, but sometimes they, um, for many many years, they didn't have a partner uh, with whom this discussion could be uh, happening. Um, so, uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Adam, for spending this this, this evening uh, with us and for working um, at the exhibition. Um, dear the listeners, participants, thank you very much for joining. Um, again, please please uh, be following the Galicia Jewish Museum uh, we're currently on Facebook, um, on, on our website as well. Um, it's 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 now we have problem problems technical problems, but it should be on soon. And we hope to see you in Krakow um, sooner or later. Uh, but definitely, we hope to see you for the opening of this uh, new exhibition uh, this this summer. Um, so thank you very much. Please stay safe. Uh, be well. Adam, thank you once again for joining thanks, us. Sir. Thanks for having me, Philba. Um, uh, yeah. Have a good night. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Stay safe. Good night.